One rather nice thing about being me is that people sometimes send me books. Uh, this is great, and I do not wish for one instant to come across in any way as ungrateful. But I do have to say to people that if you do send me a book, and I don't want to discourage you, uh, please don't expect me to read it anytime soon, particularly if it's very long. Um, I, when I read a book, I take uh, careful notes, usually, and um, I'm not the quickest of readers. Uh, but two books that I have been sent that I want to talk about in this video are From the City, From the Plough by Alexander Barron, and The Last Panther uh, by Wolfgang Faust. Both of these books were sent to me uh, quite unexpectedly out of the blue. Um, and uh, this one was sent to me by the uh, curator of the Bobbington Tank Museum. And uh, he says, not tanks, uh, but this one is to me an all-time classic. And I thought, oh, great. Although I was a little bit surprised, because if it were an all-time classic about World War II, I would expect to have heard of it. Have you heard of it? I've asked lots of people who are into books and World War II and Militaria and stuff, do they know this book? And it seems that they don't. Which is odd, because it was, in its day, an enormous hit. Uh, it came out shortly after the war and very quickly sold over a million copies. It was, if you like, the All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, but for World War II. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front is a, a very famous uh, film. Uh, in fact, it's two films and a miniseries. Uh, but it was originally, of course, a book, a, a novel, and it tells the the ordinary story of ordinary soldiers being trained and then going to fight in World War One. And after World War Two, publishers weren't publishing very many war books. People had had six years of war and they wanted escapism, but they were reading stuff about commandos and uh, loads and loads of prisoner of war escape books and spies and so forth, the, the individual heroes and members of elite units. Uh, some of those books were selling, uh, but just ordinary man goes to war, people had wanted escapism. Um, but From the City, From the Plough, uh, which was originally called 5th Battalion, but the, the publishers changed it for a less military sounding name because they thought it would be more commercial, um, is a story about the ordinary man going to war. And it's a novel, but it's actually a thinly veiled memoir because um, the, the the author, Alexander Barron, who was actually uh, Bernstein, well, the Americans would say Bernstein for some reason, um, he uh, was a, uh, a, a communist. He was actually the leader of the Young uh, Communist League. And uh, that stopped him being an officer, for instance, because you can't have uh, officers who are communists. You know, that, that's, that just doesn't do at all. Um, when he, uh, well, before the war even started, uh, he wanted to, to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but uh, for the International Brigade, but uh, the Communist Party in Britain forbade him uh, because they considered him too valuable. And he also wanted to, to, to join uh, the RAF, but he was uh, um, not allowed to because he had poor eyesight. Uh, and to do that, he had to go against the Communist Party's wishes, because don't forget, at the start of World War II, the Communists and the Fascists are allies. And so the Communists didn't want to do anything um, to upset their allies. So um, they were discouraging people from uh, signing up. But Alexandra Baron, uh, Bernstein, he wanted to do his bit. He wanted to fight fascists. Um, and uh, he joined up, did his basic training. He went to Sicily, then later he fought in Italy. Uh, and then he was taken back to Britain and uh, retrained in readiness for D-Day. And before launching for D-Day, uh, he burnt a lot of his kit. Uh, it wasn't just him. Loads of men were doing this. They had to strip down to just what they were going to carry with them and all their extra bits and bobs. Uh, if they weren't going to send it home or whatever, just burn it. And one of the things he burnt was a novel he had written. Yep, he'd written a novel, but... Clearly, I can't tell you exactly what was in it, but clearly he thought it was now worthless because of his experiences. He had been taking notes in preparation for writing a, a novel about the war, about the experience of going to war, about men in war and what they're actually like. And he decided that the book that he'd already written was, in the light of his experience, now rubbish. He had witnessed a lot of quite disturbing things. Um, for instance, uh, he saw uh, a lot of uh, soldiers taking uh, sexual advantage of a homosexual uh, uh, soldier, and uh, these were miners, as in coal miners, and he had been brought up in the Communist uh, League to believe that these were absolute models of proletarian perfection, and yet they were behaving in this extremely questionable way, and that shocked him to his core. Um, and he, another time, he was swimming in the sea, and a load of Highlanders came along and started lobbing grenades into the sea, which went off and drove um, uh, Alex and uh, his colleagues deeper 
deeper into into the sea to get away from the, the grenades. And then when the Highlanders got bored, they went away. And then it later turned out that one of the men had drowned. And he was shocked to see how these men viewed life in war as just so cheap. Another thing that he was, when writing this, unafraid to do was show officers in actually quite a good light. The officers, not all of them, but most of the officers in this are basically decent and even very good people. Um, oh, and uh, in common, uh, in, in accord with uh, an earlier video of mine called British Officers Don't Duck, I don't know if you've seen that one, um, not once, not twice, not three, four times, four times in this book, a British officer is under very heavy fire and whilst everyone else is taking cover, uh, stands as though in no danger whatsoever and calmly gets on with uh, giving orders and inspires the men by so doing. It's always described as very inspiring, uh, although admittedly one of these men does get shot. But there you go, still very inspiring. Now, this book was hugely praised by the critics for being absolutely believable. It rang absolutely true. And it was ringing true with men who had been there and done that. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's a, a huge compliment to its, uh, its realism. In fact, it was so real that a lot of people started putting two and two together and realising that, hang on, I think I served in this unit. Yes, the, the 5th Wessex, which is the, the unit, uh, the battalion, which uh, is the, the, the star of this show, uh, is actually based on the 5th Wiltshire's. Um, and some of the individuals were based on actual real-life individuals. So this is really, you could say, a war memoir thinly disguised as a novel. But it gives him a lot of license to examine the thoughts of the going through men's heads. He, having been to war, he felt that he understood uh, men an awful lot better. And uh, I, I do love the way it's, it, it's written. It's, got, it's quite stark a lot of the time, but there's just enough poetry in it. Um, to, to uh, carry the atmosphere. For instance, um, now towards dawn, the barrage was slackening. The men moved over the last hilltop that faced their objective and walked quietly downhill, their rifles at the trail or slung, hidden from view by the milky white mist that clung to the hillsides. The infantrymen filed silently into their positions along the valley, sinking down out of sight against the banks of sunken lanes. The icy dew soaked through their trousers. The chill of the dawn lay like cold steel against their cheeks. The first light stealing over the ridge touched the black fringe of the treetops on the hillside, and a multitude of birds awoke to shrill song. There was no other sound in the morning." He says a lot with that. Those men walked to the start line to go into action. These, at this, uh, this point, these are, these are veterans who have been through the thick of it and have lost many friends, and they are just getting on with it, and no one is talking. No one is talking. The fact that there's no dialogue here and the birds are singing and those are the only sounds uh, says so much about those men just getting on with it. And I love the phrase, lay like cold steel against their cheeks. That's just, I, I can feel it. It's, it's, it's visceral cold feeling. And like cold steel, you think of a bayonet or something, don't you, against a cheek. It's that, that the threat of death that's with you. Uh, anyway, as I say, it's largely about just what real men are like in war and in training for war. And I thought I'd read a longer excerpt, if that's all right with you. So setting the scene now, uh, the men are being trained in how to use the Bren gun. And just in case you don't know what a Bren gun is, it's a very fine light machine gun that was used in World War II by the British. And uh, I've made some videos about the Bren gun. You might want to watch them. Uh, right. Sergeant Shannon looked around him. Most of the platoon were watching intently. One or two seemed bored. The big Irishman stood slackly, looking away over their heads towards the sea. He caught the sergeant's eye and for a moment returned his stare. Then he turned his head and looked out to sea again. The move was deliberate, studied. Sergeant Shannon knew about men and he knew that there was a challenge to him here, but he was determined not to pick on the man. He ignored him and moved over again towards the men on the guns. Three more men came out. They were just beginning to dismantle the guns when the sergeant heard a rumbling whisper behind him. He knew before he turned that it was the Irishman. That'll do, Mulrooney, he said quietly. Pay attention now, like the rest. Private Mulrooney, rumbled the Irishman. What's that? The sergeant straightened up sharply towards him. Address me by my rank, sergeant, said the Irishman. Same as I do you. I am a soldier with, serv with service, sergeant. I know my rights. 
The sergeant sucked at his lower lip for a second. "'You may be with us for some time,' he said quietly. "'Why look for trouble? "'You do best to learn to get on with the lads and with me. "'This lawyer stuff will do you no good here. "'I know you're right as well as you do, "'and I'll not try and deny them to you. "'Now, stand up straight and pay attention.' "'The Irishman straightened up. "'The other men were watching him now. "'He did it exaggeratedly, derisively. "'His face was impassive, but his eyes were grinning.' The sergeant ignored him and called the attention of the platoon back to the guns. As he directed the next three men, he fought with a little core of worry within. Was he being too easy, he wondered. Was he giving this man the idea that he was frightened of an encounter? Maybe, he thought, I should have acted on my hunch and ridden him from the start. Give this kind an inch and they'll take a yard and a half. The Irishman would be clever, he knew that damned clever, able to goad and ridicule an NCO without saying anything punishable, able to call to his aid every rule in the King's regulations. The sergeant looked up at, uh, to call the next three men. He found half the platoon ignoring the guns, looking instead at the Irishman. Mulrooney stood, turned half away, leaning on his rifle. Mulrooney, said the sergeant, I'll not tell you again, face your front. Mulrooney faced front. What's the first thing you do, snapped the sergeant, when you strip a Breton? Private Mulrooney. No offence, sergeant, answered Mulrooney. His voice was unexpectedly soft and deadly. But I was stripping them guns before he was out of school. Do you not wonder I don't interest myself in it no more? Look, he held up his sleeve. With service stripes there. Seven years, sergeant, he said. You'll not be ignoring them now, will you? Here was the challenge direct. Sergeant Shannon knew that his platoon liked him, but they had not yet been into battle with him. Some of them had only known him for this short period of training. He knew how uneasy was the relationship, how easily it could be upset, how quickly he could be discredited. He knew that this man, sullen and alone though he was, had the fire in him and the brute power that could make him contend for the leadership of any group in which he found himself, regardless of rank. Threats or punishment would not stop this man. Shannon knew that. The Irishman had the resource and the prestige of an old soldier and, above all, he would be among the men day and night, living with them in their hut, while Shannon only saw them on parade, intriguing, provoking, telling them his tale with the sly skill of an old soldier. Shannon knew his man, and he knew that the only way to avoid being made a fool by this towering Irishman was to make a fool of him, to win the rest of the platoon against him, to isolate him. There would be no absorbing of this man into the group, to try would be foolish. So, will Sergeant Shannon best Private Mulrooney? You're going to have to read the book to find out. Um, so there you go. So there's one book. And now the next book is The Last Panther. Now this one, uh, another true story. It's uh, the, uh, the memoirs of a panther tank commander. And he's in the Kessel. It's 1945. And the, the Soviet forces have completely surrounded the Ninth Army, uh, about uh, 25 miles south of Berlin. And they're in a castle, which means cauldron, a pocket, if you like. So the Germans want to break out. They want to break out because they do not want to have to surrender to the Soviets. Uh, surrender to the Soviets means rape for the women and, and possibly death for the, the men, or at best being sent to a gulag and being starved and frozen and then probably death again. So they do not want to uh, surrender to the Russians. So they have to fight west, link up with the 12th Army, and uh, get across the River Elba and surrender instead to the Americans. So. Uh, that's the, the true life, if you like, historical setting of this book. And I started reading it. And in my manner, I started taking notes. When I, when I read a book, I, I take notes. So uh, when did I start? Uh, here we go. The Last Panther. I started my notes there. And I was taking, there was quite a lot in this book. And I was taking detailed notes for several pages uh, until I got to chapter three, uh, which is there. And then that's all my notes for the entirety of the rest of the book. Um, because... I came to a conclusion by chapter three, and that is, this book is a fake. Um, there, are, there are, right from the start, I had some suspicion, but I, I took it on trust. Um, but it looks, it has the look, physical look of, of the self-published book. Uh, it doesn't say who the translator is 
at the front. Um, it says the estate of Wolfgang Faust. It gives no details about the original German language version, but it insists that it was translated from a book that was written a long time ago by someone who was there in the war itself. Um, I noticed later, uh, looking in the back, that another book by Wolfgang Faust Wolfgang Faust, that's just so German, that name, isn't it? Military. He's a panzer, a panzer crewman, so he might be panzer Faust. Hmm, yeah, right. Um, it's called Tiger Tracks, and there's a review of it. And the review says, Among the most impressive narratives of the Eastern Front that I have read, the pages are alive with characters, their machines, their struggles, their decisions, and their pain. Readers will finish this book haunted and truly moved, the mark of a great story. According to Chris Ziedler, the translator of... The Last Panther. Yeah, so probably actually the translator of Tiger Tracks and probably I would say the author of Tiger Tracks and The Last Panther. Um, there are quite a few historically questionable things. Um, for instance, at one point he shoots at a Russian through the pistol port in the, in the rear of his panther turret. Which is odd because the rear uh, turret of a panther didn't have a pistol port. Um, uh, and it's odd that he he gives no specific dates and no names of individuals or units that would make any of this verifiable. There's only one named uh, character in the whole book, and that's his commanding officer, who's simply called Capo. Um, the, the German words, when they appear, uh, are a bit mangled, uh, which is odd for someone translating from the German. I mean, their German would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Um, and But... Most of all, the thing which really made me more suspicious than anything else was the sheer spectacularness of absolutely everything that happens. It's just action, action, action all the way. Um, and um, when, when a, a load of men are felled by a burst of machine gun fire, they are decapitated. Really? Decapitated? I'm not going to say that's impossible, but it's pretty unlikely. And he sees so much. He sees everything. Um, when I read other tankers' memoirs, they often talk about um, seeing a flash in a hedgerow some thousand or two yards away and firing several shots at that hedge and then nothing fires back. So did they get it? Has the guy retreated? Was there nothing there in the first place? Well, I don't know. They're firing at suspicions of the enemy. But in this, the enemy is always in plain sight. Suddenly a T-34 appears 50 yards away and tanks are ramming each other a lot. Everything happens in very, very close quarter, plain view. And he sees, a lot of the time he describes himself as buttoned up in his tank and looking at things through his periscope. It's amazing what he's able to see through his periscope at night in the middle of a battle. The detail, he sees every hit hitting every tank. Whenever there's a, a fight between several tanks, he can tell you exactly which tank fired at which when and, and, and what happened. And Well, I'll just, just read one description here. Um, some some Yag Panzer fours. Oh, that's another thing which may be suspicious. Um, in this book, he comes across uh, like, like the, the the German tank spotter's guide to of all the favourite tanks. He he comes across Panthers and Yag Panthers and King Tigers and Tigers and Yag Tigers and Hetzers and you know just the whole. He, he's got the set in here anyway. Um, three Yag Panzer fours are, are trying to make a dash across the open at this point. Just as the low squat vehicle lurched off into the clearing, the shapes of Sturmoviks tore over us, their shadows filling the roadway. The Jagdpanzer accelerated, committed now to making a break for the denser trees, and made it halfway. Then a volley of rockets smashed down through the trees, splitting the branches apart, and struck the Jagdpanzer directly on its flank. The machine reared up into the air. They do an awful lot of rearing up into the air, um, machines in this, and strictly no rearing, I, I would say. Uh, anyway, and it crashed down onto its tracks and lost control. Oh yeah, almost every vehicle knocked out in this. If it's small, it flies end over end a few times. Um, and uh, if it's uh, a tank, it's usually going at very high speed when it gets hit, which means it could then veer off course and then uh, near invariably crash into something significant, which then usually explodes. Um, with smoke pouring from its grills, it veered, I told you it would veer, it veered sideways into the trees beside the roads, road, knocking down several in its momentum and tipping over onto its side. The trees swayed and crashed to the ground and, and this only exposed the stretch of road more brutally, giving the red pilots a clearer view of what was down in the forest. Flames poured from the Jagdpanzer's engine as it came to a stop in a whirl of broken wood, its upper deck facing the break in the tree cover. Yeah, yeah, right. There are an awful lot of uh, mountains of fire that illuminate the uh, landscape uh, for 
miles around and and coils of smoke or, or thing, things being wreathed in smoke or flame. Yeah, it's a it's a tale which takes uh, historical inspiration of an actual event, but um, I'm quite unconvinced by this. And uh, when I got to the end, I did a bit of googling and I found that several other people have come to the same conclusion. No one seems to have been able to find trace of the German original um, or anything else about Wolfgang Faust or any of the units that he's meant to have been with. I haven't read uh, the last the the, the the other book he read. Uh, he wrote Tiger Tracks, nor will I. Uh, though apparently I found in a, in a forum online a number of people thought it was a bit questionable that in 1943 he appears to be fighting against Joseph Stalin threes, which didn't come out until right near the end of the war in 1945. So, yes, um, if. You want to read a book about what actually goes through a real man's mind when he goes to war, uh, then uh, I would quite definitely recommend this one. If, by contrast, you want to read about loads and loads of really big explosions, there's always this one.